OK, so I guess we can begin. Uh, this is my last lecture about uh, particle and cell methods. So today, my subject is uh, applications of the numerical techniques we uh, talked about. And um, the, what I'll concentrate on is uh, just show you a few applications of uh, particularly drawn from my research on how we uh, apply these methods and try to learn something about astrophysics. So the um, <coughs> three things that seem to be a theme uh, have to do with acceleration, reconnection, and dissipation, uh, which um, are uh, uh, very interesting to study uh, with these kinetic simulations. So I call this adventures in plasma astrophysics because uh, we're uh, kind of on a random walk through an interesting subfield of uh, of astrophysics. So what, what is plasma astrophysics? So uh, different people have different definitions, so I have my own. So um, of course, we know that everything is plasma. That's, that doesn't make everything plasma astrophysics, right? Uh, the <coughs> particularly this fact that plasma scales are typically much smaller than astrophysical scales uh, <coughs> make it ignorable for most of the things in astrophysics. Um, so most interesting effects then have to do when um, the microscopic physics actually can affect macroscopic observables. And uh, that's the thing I'm uh, most interested in, when the smallest thing can affect the largest thing. And um, uh, so it's the most disturbing thing about this in astrophysics is that uh, these effects are typically uh, either ignored or badly parameterized or both. Uh, and uh, <coughs> That's, uh, that's the thing we're trying to uncover. So we're trying to see how we can better parameterize things uh, based on uh, ab initio calculations. So uh, some of the things we did discuss in the previous lectures, I'll, I'll just mention the uh, different effects that seem to be important and can be studied with these tools, um, is uh, so plasma effects on high energy astrophysics, which is the field I'm usually thinking about. Uh, so in, in accretion disks, we talked about the origin of uh, viscosity, and the uh, MRI was uh, brought up in previous lectures. And uh, here, the, uh, <coughs> the beginning of the MRI is fairly uh, easy to understand from MHD. What is not uh, easy to understand is where does this cascade of turbulence goes? Uh, how does it uh, terminate? How do, does it dissipate? And um, whether you can naturally get to temperature flows, uh, whether the end of the energy deposition goes into electrons or ions, and uh, those things are uh, extremely important for the structure of the disk and uh, various observations. Also, most disks show non-thermal uh, power loss, which people interpret as uh, some sort of uh, compactization that happens in a very hot corona of a disk. Uh, where these coronas uh, come from and what kind of particles are causing compactization is usually parameterized, uh, yet it is a physical process that one should be able to understand. So that's very interesting. Um, <coughs> the questions we uh, did mention before is in clusters of galaxies, heat conduction and uh, resistivity seem to be dependent on transport entangled magnetic fields and anisotropic conduction along the magnetic fields is uh, important. That was, was covered in detail. And um, also, in these clusters, uh, there's potential for non-thermal pressure support from accelerated particles and, uh, 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 and the presence or absence thereof of uh, cosmic rays in these uh, objects can be understood. So <coughs> other e examples have to do with supernova remnants. So uh, here we have uh, <coughs> uh, they're usually shining, uh, many supernova remnants, are, particularly young ones, show uh, very vigorous non-thermal emission. So uh, here you can see these rims of synchrotron radiation, uh, blue rims uh, surrounding the expanding supernova remnant. All these colorful things are X-ray lines. Uh, they're not that important from plasma astrophysics point of view, but these non-thermal things, the blue ones, are very interesting. And uh, this tells you that particles are accelerated uh, to uh, hundreds of TeVs uh, in uh, electrons are accelerated to very high energies in these shocks. Uh, 
How that comes about is very interesting and uh, depends on intrinsic structure of the shock, as we'll discuss. Uh, so here, a few interesting effects. First of all, these uh, objects are thought to be the origin of cosmic rays uh, in the galaxy and uh, <coughs> list of the galactic cosmic rays. And uh, they managed to accelerate not only electrons, as we see, but also cosmic rays, which are pr presumably protons or ions, which are invisible, but they're there, uh, and they must have effect on, this, uh, on the structure of this uh, object. And in fact, we infer the strength of the magnetic field at these shocks to be much larger than you would expect from just compression from interstellar magnetic fields. So if you just have a shock going into the interstellar magnetic field of a few microgauss, you would expect a compression of about four for a strong shock. Uh, what you infer by modeling the width of these uh, synchrotron rims, you infer hundreds of microgauss. So uh, something amplifies magnetic fields by way more than the, than the compression. And one of the going ideas is that it is the cosmic rays. So the invisible protons that are being accelerated at these shocks are somehow responsible for amplification of these magnetic fields. And I'll show you how this could uh, potentially work. Um, <clears throat> also, uh, if we're naive and just say that uh, interstellar medium plasma uh, with uh, electrons and protons just goes through the shock, you would expect, uh, um, and if there is no Coulomb interactions, you would expect electrons to thermalize to um, their own energy and ions to thermalize to their own energy, uh, and you would have a, a huge temperature difference between electrons and ions behind the shock if there was no coupling whatsoever. Um, and um, <clears throat> what people infer is that there was coupling, uh, and uh, the electron to ion temperature ratio is very different from uh, 1 over 1836. And uh, <clears throat> it depends on various parameters, depends on velocities of the shock. So how does co that comes about has to do with microphysics of a shock. So a microscopic quantity that you can measure with X-ray telescopes uh, and uh, Balmer lines, uh, you could, uh, could potentially is sensitive to microphysics of these transitions. Uh, so <clears throat> various uh, other uh, non-thermal sources besides supernova remnants show these effects. Uh, and the particular shock acceleration is very important in all of these things, pulsar wind nebulae, gamma ray burst jets, uh, and clusters of galaxies. And here, the physics of collisionless shocks, which is most of my lecture today, will be uh, very important. So how uh, supersonic flows decelerate, uh, and um, in a particular in the case where there is not much Coulomb interactions. Uh, so these shocks can uh, not only just dissipate the bulk velocity, bulk, bulk uh, energy of the flow, uh, they can also inject some uh, fraction of particles into non-thermal spectra, uh, so that, and they can accelerate these particles, and as a byproduct, they can generate magnetic fields, which itself causes the changes in the particle injection, uh, and uh, et cetera. So this is a very uh, rich problem. <coughs> Also, in some cases, uh, to explain these objects, you require power laws which are inconsistent with what shock acceleration predicts. So we'll probably get to that in Ellen's lecture. Uh, there is a particular slope of the uh, particle distribution that shocks are predicted to produce, and they cannot produce anything flatter than that. Uh, and um, it seems like there are some cases, like the Scrub Nebula, where uh, the radio emission seems to be coming with a flatter spectrum, which could be a, a signature of something that's non-shocky. There is some sort of other acceleration mechanism. We'll discuss that. Okay, other uh, places where this stuff comes up in high-energy astrophysics has to do with neutron star magnetospheres. Uh, here, this is plasma physicist's paradise. Uh, you have uh, strong magnetic fields. You have strong rotation. You have strong gravity, although you can mostly uh, ignore it comp compared to electromagnetic forces. And uh, the beautiful thing is that this thing can make its own plasma. So it can accelerate particles to crazy energies. So pair production can be important due to curvature radiation in very strong magnetic fields. So you have uh, these uh, objects which are simple, I in the ideal language, they're just simple conductors with magnetic fields spinning around. Uh, they can build their own magnetospheres from scratch. They can create plasma around them uh, and then um, while well, you can draw this dipolar field in, in the beginning, uh, you do not know a priori what is the final shape of the magnetic field when the thing is, once the plasma effects are included. And uh, that seems to be very important in order to understand all sorts of beautiful emission that we observe from these objects. So I'll talk about that too. Uh, <coughs> uh, right, let's see. So we talked 
Sasha talked about this stuff, so relativistic jets and winds and how collimation and acceleration are intrinsically uh, tied together. And uh, collimation, acceleration, and dissipation seem to be uh, also connected because to accelerate uh, something, you need to convert magnetic to kinetic energy, and these things are uh, all coupled together. How, they, how the magnetic energy gets converted into kinetic energy, there are ideal, uh, ideal paths and there are non-ideal non paths, so uh, reconnection can also be uh, very important in this business. Okay, and finally, we talked about this last time, so cosmic ray spectrum uh, goes uh, over many, many decades, and uh, where this comes from and how these cosmic rays actually get to us is uh, uh, in intrinsically uh, can be determined and affected by the kinetic physics. So cosmic ray transport, how cosmic rays propagate through interstellar, mag interstellar magnetic fields uh, is uh, something that we can study with kinetic simulations. So overall, the goals of this exercise is to uh, try to explain the macroscopic object. We, we want to model the macroscopic objects, but uh, we want to use microphysical parameterizations that are based on real physics. And um, this seems like a crazy thing to do, as usual, because the scales of our simulation are going to be tiny. The things that we need to explain are necessarily huge. Uh, and how to connect the two scales is not always obvious, but we will try. And uh, <clears throat> uh, so the, the hope is that we can constrain some of the scenarios uh, in, uh, in astrophysics based on the microphysic, realistic microphysics that we can uh, simulate. So the three things I'll uh, focus on is collisional shocks and particle acceleration, uh, relativistic magnetospheres of neutron stars, and uh, acceleration in uh, relativistic reconnection. And if I have a time, I'll mention something about laboratory applications. Okay, so uh, we spent a lot of time talking about the methods that we use. So it's mainly the particle and cell code, uh, which you now have, uh, but uh, also a uh, large chunk of this work was done using a hybrid simulation, uh, which is uh, called D-hybrid. Uh, it's very similar to other hybrid codes that are around. Uh, this was written by Louis Gargatti uh, back uh, a, few years, a few years ago. So this one has kinetic ions and fluid electrons. Uh, and also uh, other things we've uh, used included uh, uh, MHD codes, the relativistic MHD codes, and what's called force-free codes, which are the uh, applications of relativistic MHD for very highly magnetized situations, which is useful for pulsars. Okay, so let's talk about shocks. Uh, the, um, <coughs> basically, a shock is, uh, as you know, just the way a supersonic flow encounters an obstacle and uh, slows down to become in causal contact with the obstacle. And uh, in the uh, Earth environment, uh, so a bullet flying through the air, these shocks uh, have a thickness that is determined by the mean free path of particles in air. So micron size mean free path translates to very thin uh, shock transition. In this shock, density increases, velocity slows down, temperature increases. Uh, so that's great. Uh, in astrophysical shocks, uh, the mean free path can be as large as the object itself. So in, in supernova remnants, it could be you know, a half of the size of the supernova remnant. Technically, the, just the two particle Coulomb collisions, because plasma are so dilute and the velocities are so large, tens of thousands of kilometers per second, a uh, few thousand kilometers per second for these shocks. Uh, the mean free path can be very large. So Coulomb collisions are probably not important, and therefore these shocks have to be mediated by some other physics. And uh, that physics has to do with um, uh, interaction between particles and collective electromagnetic fields created or supported by other particles. So <coughs> uh, this, uh, right, so th this is why we talk about these strange name collision-less shocks. Um, so, the, from MHD, uh, as, you've, as you know by now, uh, looking at uh, how Athena solves uh, shocks, uh, a shock is nothing but a jump in the flow which conserves all of the things. It conserves momentum, density, uh, sorry, can, uh, momentum flux, energy flux, and, and so forth. And um, <clears throat> it's just a discontinuity. It's an infinitesimal discontinuity as far as uh, MHD is concerned. Now, uh, we know that in reality, there is some sort of plasma physics working uh, on the underside, uh, providing this effective uh, viscosity and, and resistivity that you need to 
dissipate this uh, ordered kinetic energy and uh, slow down the flow. So there are some sort of uh, demons uh, sitting under the, under the hood. Uh, and that would have been fine if these demons were just confined over there. Uh, the issue is that some of these uh, fluctuations in electromagnetic fields that cause this dissipation do inject particles into acceleration process. So we call them CRs for cosmic rays. And uh, these cosmic rays can, in principle, cycle around the shock and kind of gain energy every time they go back and forth. So this is the, uh, the first order Fermi acceleration or diffusive shock acceleration that uh, Ellen got to last time. Uh, this one uh, relies on particles being able to cross the shock and uh, be scattered from the uh, upstream and the downstream and uh, repeat the cycle many times. And uh, as you can see, this is an effectively converging situation. So the, from the point of view of the downstream, the upstream is going towards it. From the point of view of the upstream, the downstream is going towards it. Right? So it is like being stuck between two converging walls. And if a particle manages to bounce back and forth, it will gain energy. This is a very simple energy uh, gain process. Uh, what's not simple about it is how many particles get to do this, uh, how particles stay in this process, how do they not escape, or if they escape, and how do they escape, et cetera. So uh, that depends on, in some degree, on the back reaction of these cosmic rays onto the flow themselves. Because what they can do is as they stream around the shock, they will be exciting various waves and instabilities in the flow, and that can change the magnetic fields that are embedded in the flow, which, as, which as they get advected through the shock, get compressed. Uh, and eventually, you form a, some sort of a large-scale structure uh, that takes into account the pressure of cosmic rays uh, on the overall transition through the shock. So uh, microscopic thing here affected macroscopic uh, uh, transition of the shock, and in principle, these scales could be quite disparate. That's why uh, this is an interesting and complicated problem, because uh, shock structure, magnetic turbulence, and particle acceleration all are interdependent, and I cannot say which one of them is primary, uh, because, yes? So in 1D, there isn't. Uh, usually what sets the maximal energy is the size of the object or how old it is. In, in an absent other processes that can remove particles or, or make them lose energy, in 1D, there is no limit. Um, <clears throat> okay, so... Uh, so we have this kind of love triangle between these three things, and uh, it's, it's important to be able to simulate all of them together. So uh, the mechanism for acceleration already described, uh, this effective bouncing between the upstream and the downstream, and uh, it relies on um, effectively uh, particles scattering in some sort of electromagnetic fields uh, uh, fluctuations around the shock. So a particle would presumably follow a magnetic field line, and then under some favorable conditions, we'll be able to reflect and come back and cross the shock and uh, start gaining energy because of these conver converging flows. And uh, uh, it turns out that the, the process we discussed last time in Ellen's lecture, this uh, scattering between random uh, clouds, uh, gives you a slower acceleration, second order in V over C, because uh, some clouds are moving towards each other, some clouds are moving away from each other. So you, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, but on average, there's more often you encounter clouds that are moving toward you. And that's, uh, that's why it, you still accelerate, but you do it slowly. Uh, in shocks, you always see converging flows, so you always get a benefit of acceleration. That's why it's first order in V over C. So what you see is that the delta energy over energy goes like V over C, uh, was, was every crossing, and then this results in a spectrum that goes like e to some power uh, that depends on the compression ratio at the shock, so the amount of density compression you have at the shock. And um, <clears throat> so I think Ellen will go through the actual derivation of this uh, formula uh, in a, her next lecture. Uh, I'm, um, but uh, all I need to to tell you is that the slope of this uh, spectrum is fairly well constrained from theory. So by knowing the compression of the shock, 
and assuming that particles can scatter back and forth, uh, we can uh, derive the slope of this uh, uh, energy spectrum. Uh, and for a strong shock, it happens to be minus two. So energy to the minus two is the power law that you infer from these um, uh, interactions with the, uh, with the shock. Uh, what is uncertain, completely uncertain, is this normalization. So in principle, this normalization can be zero. So there may be no particles accelerated at all, or it could be tens of percent, in which case you're putting a lot of your thermal energy into a power law. Uh, and what determines which of these uh, options you have has to do with microphysics. Uh, because what determines who gets injected into this process is reliant on the understanding the microphysics of this transition and the nature of plasma turbulence in this transition. So uh, to understand that in more detail, we have to do this from first principles with plasma simulations. So I, I will not do a detailed derivation. It will be in the notes, and I, I think Ellen will get to it. But the idea is that on every crossing, particles gain energy, and the energy gain is proportional to the velocity difference between the upstream and the downstream. Uh, but uh, this process is lossy, because a particle has a certain probability of not making it back to the upstream, or rather making it back to the upstream. Uh, and uh, because it depends on these random scatters, and some, some particles may not be able to scatter, uh, so they will escape. So there's a certain probability of particles staying in the game. So the number of particles with the number of crossings will uh, decrease like this, where P is the probability of, of staying in the, in the acceleration process. Uh, and uh, on every crossing, they will gain, uh, their energy will increase with this factor beta, uh, which depends on the compression. And, um, from, from these two things, you can express J, the number of crossings, and uh, you will get that the N of E will be the number of particles at certain energy, get, has a power law shape, and uh, this index of the power law depends on the relative probabilities of escape and the amount of energy gain you get per cycle. And you can calculate these things precisely for uh, a strong shock. <coughs> and uh, the answer is, uh, K to the, so e to the minus two, or in momentum space, p to the minus four. Uh, okay, so what we uh, try to do with simulations is to kind of uh, see how this process actually unfolds. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> what we do is we simulate collisionless shocks uh, with particle and cell method, and uh, um, the way we set it up is we have uh, a supersonic flow impacting a wall, bouncing off the wall, and uh, that launches a shock wave that propagates into this medium. So you may wonder, what is this wall? Why is there a wall? The, the, there is no wall in astrophysics. Uh, really, there is. Uh, so uh, if you think about uh, what happens in a supernova remnant, when supernova eject are flying into the interstellar medium, what's happening is that the two fluids never mix, so the ejecta don't mix with the interstellar medium. So what's happening is that ejecta are kind of bouncing the interstellar medium particles out, and you have a shock wave propagating in the interstellar medium, right? So what, what this wall represents is a contact discontinuity between ejecta in the, and the interstellar medium uh, sitting in the frame of the contact, right? So in the frame of the contact, the interstellar medium is rushing at it, and uh, it's bouncing off and creating a shock. So that's what we're doing. Uh, we can play with the composition of the flow, with the velocity of the flow, with the magnetic field in the flow. Uh, we can put, uh, change its strength, we can change its direction, and uh, see what kind of uh, physics results. So uh, <clears throat> the few results that we have right now, so we've, we've tried both relativistic shocks, uh, which was the first thing we've done, and then now in the recent years we do more non-relativistic shocks. Uh, the reason we started with relativistic shocks is that it's easier. Uh, it was the kind of a lower hanging fruit, because once you're using a particle and cell method, you have to resolve the speed of light. And so it's for your benefit if something moves relativistic, because then, then you don't waste a lot of CPU time on uh, <coughs> advecting the speed of light around. So uh, relativistic shocks turned out to be easier to simulate. Uh, and uh, so what we find is uh, how shock mechanism depends on the magnetization of the flow. 
Uh, we see examples of particle acceleration in some of the shocks, uh, both relativistic and non-relativistic shocks. And um, we can uh, determine the efficiency of acceleration as a function of various parameters, like Mach number of the shock or the inclination of the magnetic field. We can measure the uh, diffusion coefficient around these shocks and actually see the, this diffusive shock acceleration uh, unfold, and uh, we can prove that we're seeing Fermi acceleration. And uh, we also see this uh, field amplification and cosmic ray induced instabilities. Okay, so what is the simple physics uh, that uh, I want to uh, explain? So um, imagine this. Uh, imagine that um, uh, you have uh, two clouds trying to go through each other. So in, in some appropriate frame, uh, the shock will look like two plasmas trying to go through each other. Uh, and uh, <coughs> if uh, Coulomb mean free path is enormous, then you would expect that these two plasmas just, just go through each other without affecting each other, right? And um, uh, that's fine, except this is an intrinsically a counter-streaming distribution. So there is free energy in this, and plasmas hate free energy. They usually try to tap it somehow. And uh, the way they tap it depends on whether there is pre-existing magnetic field coming with the flow or the field is very weak. So in the limit of no field at all or very weak magnetic field, then what happens is that these two counter streaming flows will create uh, filamentation. And these instabilities are called filamentation instabilities, a subclass of it's called Weibull instabilities, or et cetera. So you'll have a growth of turbulent magnetic fields from filamentation of these two flows that are going through each other, and uh, those magnetic fields will start scattering particles. So they will deflect particles uh, in these flows. And uh, if the fields are strong enough, they will, they will be able to s slow down and turn the particles around. And that's how you get a compression. So the flows will slow down, the density will increase, and that's ultimately what's causing the viscosity. I'll show you examples of this. Uh, if you have sufficient magnetic field, then uh, when you when two, two clouds try to go through each other, they, they will compress this magnetic field. And uh, as they compress the magnetic field, the particles, which were initially on just uh, flying drift orbits, uh, just E cross B drifting with the flow, uh, they see a compression in the magnetic field. They start gyrating with a different E cross B velocity. And uh, that slows down the flow, and that increases the density. And that's how you get a magnetized shock. So you can have either unmagnetized shocks, which look more uh, filamentary, uh, or you can have magnetized shocks, which look, which depend on this uh, Larmor uh, dynamics. So, roughly, these filamentary shocks will look diffuse, and the uh, magnetized shocks will look more compact, where the thickness is just given by one Larmor radius of the particle uh, going uh, going through the shock. Okay, so uh, we've uh, uh, tried to see to, to kind of map out the parameter space for astrophysical plasmas, and uh, uh, this kind of diagram is oversimplified but useful. Uh, so what I show here is on this axis, I'm showing the four velocity of the shock. So this is gamma of the shock time uh, v, v over shock over C. So this is nicely encapsulates both non-relativistic shocks and relativistic shocks. Uh, and um, <clears throat> on this axis, I'm plotting magnetization. So magnetization is the ratio of magnetic energy to kinetic energy in the flow. Um, and uh, one other way to expl express it is the one over inverse, uh, so one, one divided by alphanic Mach number squared. So alphanic Mach number is velocity of the flow divided by the alphane velocity. And uh, there are many other ways to express it. Is it also ratio of cyclotron frequency, gyro frequency to plasma frequency times uh, C over V, where V is the velocity of the flow, or the ratio of the skin depth to the Larmor radius for the ions in the flow. Uh, squared. Okay, so, but basically it's a, r a ratio of energies. Uh, how much energy you're carrying in the magnetic field compared to your kinetic energy. And uh, what's shown here are different three letter abbreviations standing for different uh, astrophysical objects and where they land in this parameter space. So, uh, solar wind, uh, magnetic field is fairly strong compared to the uh, velocities of the, of the flow. So the alpha and velocity is fairly uh, significant. So uh, these are fairly low Mach number shocks or high magnetization uh, shocks. So these typical Mach numbers are around 10 uh, or less are encountered in the Earth bow shock and solar wind. So supernova remnants, uh, they have a range. We don't exactly know. So the, the, the 
thickness of these uh, blobs is a rough idea of the error bar. Uh, so uh, the, the velocity is here a few thousand kilometers per second, and the magnetization can range uh, anywhere from, so Mach number can go anywhere from a few tens to a few hundreds. Uh, these shocks are in galaxy clusters, so here the velocities are again uh, 500 to 1,000 kilometers per second, and um, these are stuff accreting onto a galaxy cluster. Uh, the magnetization is really unknown. There could be very weak magnetic field, or there could be sort of interstellar, uh, intergalactic magnetic fields. Uh, so we don't know exactly. Uh, the AGN jets here uh, are in the relativistic territory, gamma of about 10. Uh, magnetic field uh, could be very strong. They could be pointing dominated compared to the kinetic energy, or it could be very small when the pointing flux has dissipated. So we don't, there's a big range. Uh, pulsar wind nebulae, uh, they uh, are powered by pulsars, uh, create, creating a wind in, inside of a supernova remnant. Uh, so these things um, have fairly large gamma factor, could be all the way up to 10 to the 6. Uh, and uh, the magnetization is probably something like 10 to the minus 3. We don't exactly know, but it's, around, it's fairly small. Uh, gamma ray bursts uh, have large gamma factors from 100 to 1,000, and uh, they're typically, uh, things we're interested in here are the forward shocks of gamma ray bursts. Uh, they propagate in the interstellar medium, and when you compare a gamma of 100 flow uh, with a few microgauss magnetic field in the uh, interstellar medium, this ratio tells you that the magnetization is very small. So these shocks are very interesting because they effectively propagate in an environment where the magnetic field is very weak compared to the kinetic energy of the flow. So this could be completely unmagnetized shocks. Okay, so what we map out is kind of which regimes show magnetic reflections, which regimes show filamentation, and uh, uh, without further ado, let me show you some examples of this. So this is uh, uh, a pair plasma uh, impacting a wall. So this is a relativistic pair shock, uh, gamma of 15. Uh, is going to impact this wall, reflect from the wall, and you will see uh, this is evolution of density, this is evolution of magnetic energy uh, in two dimensions, and this is the profile of, magnetic en uh, of density and magnetic energy. Is there a way to lower the light somehow? Can I do this here? Or? No. Uh huh. Ooh. <laughs> Pandora's box. Okay. Uh, I'm not. There are lots of shades, but I don't. Okay. Anyways, doesn't matter. Uh, so, <clears throat> what you see here is uh, one simulation effect. Uh, I was just. Is there some way to lower the light a little bit? Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so the simulation effect here is you see this thing. Uh, this seems to be propagating to the right. This is uh, what I call a moving injector. So remember I told you that we, we don't like wasting time in our simulations. So if I really did the simulation for, uh, in the full domain in the very beginning, I'll have to fill it with plasma that does not, absolutely nothing for a long time. So instead I have an enlarging box. Uh, so my box is increasing in time. And uh, I have effectively have a, a moving injector, which injects uh, relativistic plasma from this wall. Uh, and then this wall reflects plasma. So that this black stuff is just my expanding box. Uh, so the initial plasma comes in with no magnetic field. Uh, and uh, what you see here is uh, creation of magnetic field from almost nothing. And this comes, I'll, I'll explain how this comes about. Uh, you see a compression. So this, in density, you see a, a shock front. This is a, obviously something propagating against the flow here. Uh, if you look at the shock jump conditions, if you average, uh, average this way, you will see a compression, and this compression corresponds to what you get in two dimensions uh, with a relativistic uh, equation of state. So compression over a, few, a bit more than three. Uh, and uh, uh, this shows the magnetic energy. So you see these filamentations over here in magnetic energy. They add up to some maximum at around the shock, and then these magnetic fields start to decay uh, behind the shock. So uh, what is going on? Um, what's going on is this uh, Weibull instability that I, I mentioned last time, and the thing you've been able to simulate in your homework, uh, is that uh, there are some particles that are uh, going uh, 
uh, away from the shock, they're reflected from the shock, they're interacting with an incoming flow, and this is again a counter-streaming distribution which creates these magnetic fields from nothing and uh, makes them uh, deflect particles in such a way as to amplify the magnetic field because they're increasing the currents. So they, they, they get amplified, these currents get arranged in such a way as to amplify the magnetic field. And that's what we, uh, what we see here. So these are the filaments in the upstream. They get tangled and disrupted as you get through the shock. Uh, this is where the field reaches its maximum, the generated field, and then the field is decaying in the downstream. Uh, in uh, three dimensions, these filaments really look like filaments. Uh, and uh, in cross section, they actually look like loops. So, th so you get these uh, magnetic loops around each current filament, uh, as you should. Uh, and uh, then these loops merge and they get very nonlinear as you get into the shock. Uh, okay, so that's the, the way these fields uh, look like. Uh, what do particles do? So remember I told you that looking at individual particles is usually a bad idea. Uh, so let me show you that. Uh, so what I show here is uh, trajectories of a small fraction of particles from the simulation. Uh, and I'm showing a piece of the trajectory, so it's a, a little bit forward and backward in time compared to where the particle is right now. So in the background, the color is the magnetic energy. So you see this filamentation here. Uh, and uh, you see some yellow particles here, and you see some red particles corresponding to electrons and, and positrons. And uh, to zeroth order, what you see that there is ordered motion here, as, it, as there should be, this is supersonic. And then there is kind of randomized motion over here. So you see particles going all over the place. and uh, that's what you kind of expect from a thermal gas, right? You have a, a gas with random walk, and uh, that's what's happening here. There is no collisions. The effective collisions are scattering on these magnetic islands. So these magnetic islands do randomize my, my particles, and it looks like it's a collisional gas, but it's really they're scattering off magnetic fields. Some particles get stuck on the magnetic filaments. You can see that they start gyrating around them. Uh, Okay, so that's roughly what you, you expect, and there is not, not much interesting. What you do notice if you stare at this for a few minutes is that there are some weird particles like this one, or like that one, or like this one, or like this one. So they seem to be going upstream, or sideways, so I call them salmons, uh, because they, they, they like to go against the flow. And uh, it is these guys that seem to be the most important ones. Uh, so uh, they're the rebels, they, they try to... Uh, not go with the flow. And uh, <clears throat> what they do is uh, they are the ones that uh, initialize this instability. So these are the particles reflected from the shock. And then when they counter stream with the incoming flow, they get uh, the instability going. And then these particles are already energized. So you see them uh, going sideways at fairly large momenta. Uh, so these particles have already participated in the acceleration process. Uh, okay, so. A uh, somewhat better way of looking at this is uh, to look at what I call momentum space. So uh, this is the uh, x direction versus uh, x momentum. And um, uh, in this frame, the downstream is sitting with the velocity of the wall, which is not going anywhere. So the downstream is hot and average velocity is zero. That's, that's my downstream. The incoming flow has a gamma of 15, and it's coming in this way. So it's a negative, gamma, uh, gamma, negative momentum over here. That's my incoming flow. And these are returning particles. So you can see there is a population of particles with positive momentum. There are a few of them. The, the color here is logarithmic. But there are a few of them, but they definitely go back. They go back towards the upstream. And it is these particles that cause these filaments in the first place. And these filaments, when they grow nonlinear, and they totally separate the, the charges in the plasma and, and scatter the particle, that's when the shock comes. So the, the shock is a self-propagating self nonlinear thing that's being created by itself. So it's a lovely problem to study uh, because everything is so nonlinear. And uh, partially this is why th these methods are useful because, uh, to be honest, they're fairly noisy methods. Uh, and uh, if you will really want to study a very small fluctuation, good luck to you. But you know, these things are very, very hard to miss. They're a huge, huge perturbation in the plasma. So that's the kind of effect PIC methods are really good for. Uh, OK, so um, 
Fine, so what do we see in terms of spectra? What we see is there are particles accelerated. So this is the downstream spectrum uh, from the simulation, energy versus uh, uh, number of particles. And what you see here is the bulk of the particles have thermalized. There is a nice Maxwellian. The average energy of this Maxwellian is average energy of the incoming flow. Uh, but then there is a tail, and this tail uh, can be fitted with a power law with an exponential cutoff. And as time marches on, this exponential cutoff is marching on as well. So it's increasing to higher energy. Uh, and this is uh, very characteristic of what uh, shock acceleration is doing. So these particles get to larger and larger energy as, as function of time. Uh, so initially, you could have fitted it with uh, two Maxwellians. But as time goes on, uh, the two Maxwellian fit doesn't work anymore. And you, you, you have to provide more. And power law is a much better fit. And uh, for these shocks, we typically see like 10% of energy going into this tail, a few percent by number. Uh, this is a, a orbit of one of the lucky particles that got accelerated. So uh, here I'm showing its energy as a function of time. And again, a piece of its orbit as it's flying around. The radius of the particle represents the energy of the particle. So it gets fatter as it gets more energetic. Uh, and you can see that it crossed the shock. It's uh, sitting here. Then it's crossed the shock this way. It gets uh, hit by the incoming flow. Its energy goes up. So these steps correspond to bounces between the upstream and the downstream, as Fermi predicted. So uh, we have this. Uh, well, actually, he didn't predict that. Uh, the shock acceleration uh, was really developed as a theory in, in the in the 70s. Uh, but uh, the Right, so, so, but these kind of steps is what you get from these convergent flows. OK, so that's uh, the simplest thing you can do with uh, no initial magnetic field, just uh, self-generated magnetic field. And these kinds of shocks seem to be important for, say, gamma ray bursts, where you have very weak magnetization in the upstream. Um, this is what happens um, as we, uh, sorry. Uh, as we uh, change the, add the external magnetic field. So here you have no magnetic field. Uh, for, in this particular simulation, I actually did collide two flows uh, at each other. Uh, so you see the magnetic field, uh, magnetic energy in this plane, and the density is in this plane. So you see uh, a, a shock. Actually, you have two shocks. So you have a contact discontinuity, the two shocks propagating back into each flow. Uh, and uh, this is an unmagnetized case where you see these magnetic loops. What happens as we add magnetic field? Uh, you can see that the loops, uh, which were in initially circles, become kind of like pancakes. Uh, this is because the external magnetic field is suppressing filamentation in one of the directions. It's easy for particles to go along the field, but it's harder for them to go across the field. So you can still have uh, separation of flows in the along the magnetic field. That's why you see these pancakes. But you don't have much in this direction. So the loops become uh, more, more elongated. Uh, and then at some point, there is a transition, and you switch to magnetized shock. So here, there is no more filaments. Uh, you don't see anything, uh, any dramatic uh, filamentation in the shock. Uh, you do see this kind of electromagnetic wave that precedes the shock. And uh, the thickness of this transition is now a Larmor radius. So as we add magnetic fields, new things appear. Uh, more interesting physics comes out. And uh, I, won't, I won't go into all of the details, of course. But just roughly, what's, what's important when you have magnetic fields is that you do still have shocks, uh, because you know, mag momentum and energy have to be conserved, and you have to stop the flow. So the shock still happens, but whether it accelerates particle or not really depends on the inclination of the magnetic field and the direction of the magnetic field. So there are two kinds of magnetized shocks. Uh, what's called, what's called quasi-perpendicular shocks and quasi-parallel shocks. So perpendicular and, and parallel uh, with respect to the direction of the normal to the shock surface. Okay, so uh, if a shock is moving uh, this way, uh, perpendicular shock means that the magnetic field is transverse uh, to the direction of the flow, roughly. Uh, so in this case, the magnetic field, let's say, at 75 degrees. And what I show here is a density profile. Uh, this is two-dimensional density. This is momentum space. And uh, you can see that there is an incoming stream, which nicely thermalized. There is nobody coming back. There is no particles at positive momentum. So this spells trouble for acceleration. This means that if nobody is coming back, they're probably not going to get accelerated. And indeed, these shocks are very bad for acceleration. 
Uh, this is a quasi-parallel shock. So magnetic field was along the direction of the flow. And uh, what you see is that, um, sorry, this was magnetic field actually, right? the plot of the magnetic component in the y direction. Uh, this is transfer, uh, the magnetic component in the y direction. And what you see is that uh, there is some sort of a circularly polarized wave that's propagating in front of the shock. And in fact, it's accompanied by returning stream of particles. So particles can escape along the magnetic field, and these particles will get accelerated. And indeed, um, if you look at what happens in a magnetized shock, uh, so this is quasi-parallel configuration, angle of inclination about 15 degrees to the normal, uh, and you can see a particle here, and it still gets, it gets to accelerate, and you can also see that it experiences gyrations. So it's, uh, it's still, it knows about the background magnetic field, and these circularly polarized waves are self-generated. So as these particles are trying to propagate back into the upstream, it's a net current that tries to move in front of the shock, and this current tries to uh, create uh, circularly polarized alphanic fluctuations. Okay, so uh, we can study how the inclination of the magnetic field affects the acceleration and so forth. So this is a few examples of different inclination angles. Uh, and you can see that you know, from zero to about 30-something degrees, uh, Acceleration actually gets more efficient as you, as you incline the shock. And then at some point, it cuts off. So anything beyond about 34 degrees uh, doesn't produce much acceleration. This is when you switch to these quasi-perpendicular shocks. And um, uh, what's going on there is that uh, at some point for these relativistic shocks, uh, in order for you to outrun the shock in, while moving along the magnetic field, there will be a certain kinematic constraint. At some point, the magnetic field will be uh, inclined so much that the, in order for a particle to outrun a relativistic shock, which moves at about c over 3 in this frame, uh, it would have to move faster than the speed of light, just because of the obliqueness. And that really cuts, cuts off acceleration. So we were hoping that there would be some sort of magic turbulence that would be so large that it that would overwhelm this effect, but it doesn't seem to work. So, uh, for large enough inclinations, the acceleration really shuts off. You don't see much, much particle acceleration here. And uh, this already starts to introduce interesting constraints on the kind of shocks you can expect in the uh, relativistic flows. Uh, so um, basically, to, to summarize this part, we have this magnetic reflection. We have uh, filamentation instability working in where the magnetization is low. Uh, and um, we see nice Fermi acceleration uh, in the low magnetization case. And uh, in the magnetized case, quasi-parallel shocks seem to be fine, and they seem to be accelerating um, both uh, ions and electrons, and they heat electrons quite well. But um, <coughs> the quasi-perpendicular ones seem to be dead. And uh, this, this is a, uh, yes? Right, so they're, so, right. so they're, they're mostly circular. There, there is some, some component al along the flow, but it's mostly circular. What about the, the parallel shocks? In the parallel shocks, uh, it's, uh, it's sort of like a helical field, uh, and it, the amplitude can get quite, the amplitude of the wave can, can get so quite large. Right. So this is yeah. What I draw, what I drew was the transverse component, but there's also longitudinal field. So the real thing is is a spiral. Right. Okay. So immediately you can start applying this to astrophysics, uh, and this is where things get questionable or interesting, depending on how you, you, you look at it. So what we're saying is that we shouldn't be having a relativistic shock with a transverse magnetic field, because those should, don't seem to accelerate particles very well. So immediately this says that for pulsar wind nebulae, which presumably have toroidal magnetic fields embedded in the flow, as the pulsar spins around, it, it winds up magnetic field mainly in a toroidal way with, with distance. And, um, we expect these shocks to, to experience a quite transverse magnetic field. And we do see acceleration. So all of these things are shining synchrotron uh, uh, in a non-thermal way. So uh, what's going on? Uh, so this probably says that um, 
the, mag the effective magnetization at the shock has to be fairly weak. Uh, this means that it, at the shock it will transition to this uh, unmagnetized regime and uh, you can still get acceleration. And uh, this implies that you need efficient dissipation of magnetic energy as the flow is up approaching the uh, determination shock. So uh, either that or there is some sort of an uh, azimuthal structure to the wind that, um, uh, not azimuthal, the, the, yeah, the, <laughs> this way, uh, latitudinal, right, latitudinal structure to the wind, uh, which uh, has different magnetization in different regions. So perhaps the equatorial region has weak magnetization, but perhaps the polar region has stronger magnetization. Um, <coughs> alternatively, uh, all of this stuff is not shocks and something else, maybe reconnection has to be invoked. Uh, for AGN jets, uh, the nicely wound toroidal magnetic field along the, uh, around the jet uh, seems to be disfavored as origin of uh, shock accelerated particles in these uh, knots uh, and, and the hot spots. Uh, so the the good thing is that the, the shocks here could be mildly relativistic, so in which case the constraints are not as bad as I, as I described. Uh, but uh, if, they're, if they do infer a nicely toroidal magnetic field wound up around the jet and the gamma factors are of order 10, then uh, we, we may have to require some sort of shear in the flow that reorients magnetic fields and uh, creates regions of quasi-parallel uh, shocks, and that, then, ca th then you can start accelerating particles. So perhaps there is some sort of a sheath or a spine in the jet that can do this. For gamma ray bursts, external shocks, low magnetization, uh, high gamma flows seem to be working quite well, and uh, so we, we, we can expect nice acceleration for the afterglow emission. Uh, the big question here is how long does this field survive, and can it survive for a very long time? And that, this, this is not, uh, not yet understood. Uh, because we see a lot of field generation right at the shock, but after the shock it seems to be falling off quite fast. When you need to explain a large volume of synchrotron emitting plasma, you want to have the field there as well. Just, just particles is not enough. So decay of the field is, a more, is still a problem that needs to be understood uh, in this field. Okay, let me uh, show some things about uh, non-relativistic shocks. So here we're interested again in the supernova remnant type uh, situations. and uh, the, uh, in the non-relativistic case, we, uh, it's not enough to just deal with electron-positron plasmas. You have to deal with electron-ion plasmas, so the separation of scales start to, uh, start to affect you quite a bit. Uh, let me just show you a few examples of things that, that happen in the non-relativistic shocks. So this is a um, uh, quasi-perpendicular um, magnetized uh, shock in the non-relativistic case. So what you see here, this is a density profile. This is the momentum space of the ions. This is momentum space of electrons. This is density in two dimensions. This is the magnetic energy and the out-of-plane component of the magnetic field. So what you see is that, uh, so there is sufficiently strong magnetic field that this is all magnetized and uh, the shock structure is mediated by this Larmor gyration of particles. So you can see that ions come in, they gyrate, and then they get advected into the downstream. Uh, uh, corresponding to this gyration is the compression in the density. Uh, and this density kind of is oscillatory as the shock is propagating. Uh, this is a two-dimensional structure of it. Uh, you can see there are interesting waves. So there are these oblique waves that seem to be propagating in front of the shock and they seem to be related to this returning ion stream. And um, uh, these waves uh, are uh, the waves I mentioned last time, these are called Whistler waves. So they're, they're propagating along the magnetic field and they have this uh, oblique, oblique structure to them. Uh, all right, so that was quite a perpendicular shock. This is quite a parallel shock. So here the, the magnetic field is along the direction of the flow. And um, in the momentum space, uh, you see reflected particles. You see ions coming back towards the upstream because it, it's easy for them to stream along the magnetic field. And uh, eventually, these shocks will produce acceleration. So this, these shocks will uh, get, ex uh, get particles accelerated. Electron acceleration um, happens uh, at least partially due to the effects of these Whistler waves. So uh, here you can see uh, an orbit of an electron in these oblique waves that sit right at the shock transition. 
And uh, you can see how electron came in and kind of gyrated around the shock for a few orbits and gained energy with every gyration. This, this kind of acceleration is called shock drift acceleration. Uh, and um, the f at first, it gained some energy from the parallel component of the electric field in this Whistler wave. So that's uh, a, a very kinetic effect from these, uh, from these waves. So that those waves seem to be injecting electrons into this acceleration process. As the particle gains more and more energy, this is second stage, it kind of drifts around the shock and samples both the upstream and the downstream. Now the particle has large enough Larmor radius to really sample the upstream and the downstream and it gets accelerated uh, in a uh, more efficient way. Um, <clears throat> so this shows some examples of how electrons can uh, get injected, and uh, indeed we see some injection of electrons in the quasi-perpendicular shocks. Uh, there is not much acceleration for ions in the quasi-perpendicular shocks. Um, quasi-parallel shocks, on the other hand, do seem to accelerate ions quite well. So uh, the long-term evolution of this process and whether the electrons really grow a, a tail much further here is still uh, under discussion, and we're still trying to figure this out. Uh, so we do see initial injection of electrons, but it's not clear whether DSA type acceleration can really proceed. These shocks seem to be sending some electrons back into the upstream, but it's not clear whether there is enough turbulence to trap them and make them accelerate. Okay, so, um, so as we saw, uh, there are two things related to shock acceleration. One is reflection of particles that go back towards the upstream, and another is the return of particles back to the downstream. So you need both injection, which is what happens at the shock, and then you need uh, turbulence that scatters you back and sends you back towards the downstream. And uh, so what we find usually is that, these, as I said, parallel shocks are good for uh, ion acceleration. Recently we found that they also accelerate electrons. Perpendicular shocks mainly inject electrons, but whether how far it goes, we, we still don't understand. So here, uh, it's useful. We wanted to study more this process of ion acceleration to see how far we can go. And uh, we needed to go to longer time scales. And this is where we switch to hybrid simulations. So in hybrid simulations, we ignore electrons, but we just look at the kinetic ions. And uh, this shows uh, an example of such a shock. So here, this is now a much larger scale. This is now skin depth of ions. Uh, and uh, here the density uh, and the magnetic uh, field out of plane. And just a few representative orbits of particles are shown. And uh, what you see is that um, these particles go, you, you see the, their tails are kind of uh, Larmor gyrations, so they, they gyrate around magnetic fields. And uh, as they bounce off the shock, they go back upstream, they drive waves, they scatter, and uh, this proceeds to give you uh, an acceleration process. So with hybrid simulations, we could actually put the, push this long enough to see a very nice uh, formation of a power law with a slope that we can uh, compare it to the theory. So, so in this case, the, the, we get the p to the minus 4 in momentum space. For non-relativistic flows, this translates to the e to the minus 1.5. And uh, so this plot is mu multiplied by e to the 1.5. So you see a nice, nice formation with time. Uh, so as as you get from blue to red line, this is time evolution, and you form uh, a very nice uh, long tail that, in ions, that proceeds uh, to get to higher energies, and the slope is uh, consistent with Fermi acceleration. And um, uh, if one of the side effects of this is that you put a few tens of percent of energy into this tail, and that energy has to come from something, and it comes from the downstream temperature of the Maxwellian. So the Maxwellian cools, uh, as and that energy went into the accelerated particles. So that's a nice nonlinear uh, effect that we, that we observe. Uh, the magnetic field gets uh, amplified by these uh, returning particles, and the physics of that has to do with um, current-driven instabilities. So cosmic rays, as they propagate, uh, so they, they move with the shock through the upstream medium, and that creates a current, so there is a net current of positive protons that tries to propagate through the upstream, and uh, upstream doesn't like that, and it starts to react uh, by compensating the current with a uh, uh, current of electrons, and um, 
this system becomes unstable because the Larmor radius of cosmic rays is much larger than the Larmor radius of electrons in the background of plasma, and uh, this, uh, this can drive a wave. So this is called a non-resonant instability uh, or Bell's instability. So the way this works is that the ions are assumed to have very large Larmor radius, uh, but the background flow is magnetized, and uh, that current of ions that you put into the uh, magnetized uh, medium, if you imagine a small loop of the magnetic field uh, around this current, it will be expelled by the J cross B forces. So what you have is a kind of growth of a circularly polarized wave. I'll show you in, in 3D, this is, is easier to, to understand. Let, let me show you this. So uh, this is a uh, density of plasma. Initially, there is magnetic field, and I'm driving a current of cosmic rays through this, through this box along the magnetic field. And uh, what you're seeing is that there are these circularly polarized waves that start to grow. And every loop of these magnetic fields uh, encompasses a current, and the J cross B force pushes it apart. So you start uh, expanding these loops, and they're frozen into the plasma. You actually also drive density compressions on the plasma. So, you, so it kind of uh, creates uh, concentrations of, of current and, and low density. So that's the, the Bell's instability driven by, uh, by cosmic rays. So this happens when the Larmor radius of cosmic rays is uh, large. Uh, eventually, this instability saturates by trapping the cosmic rays. So if the magnetic field grows large enough, the Larmor radius of the cosmic rays is no longer infinite. It get, they get confined by the magnetic field, and this transitions to a uh, uh, resonant instability, where the cosmic rays can resonate with the waves. And uh, so the, the nice thing is that we can study this in the context of a shock. So it's not just a periodic box anymore. You can actually evolve this long enough to see the, uh, uh, the formation of, the, of how these instabilities grow, uh, how they uh, create holes in the plasma, how they corrugate the, the, the shock. So you can see these uh, various nonlinear effects driven by this current. So you can see this, this current is evacuating regions in the upstream plasma, then it hits the shock, you get these interesting bubbles. Uh, you can amplify the magnetic field even more in the downstream due to turnovers uh, as the plasma is, uh, is stirred by this uh, in, inhomogeneities of the shock. So we do see magnetic field amplification, uh, and uh, we can quantify how this magnetic field amplification depends on the inclination of the shock and the Mach number. And uh, it seems like for fairly optimistic conditions, but it's, it seems reasonable to expect that uh, for uh, uh, Mach numbers that we expect from supernova remnant, we can amplify magnetic fields by factors of 40 or so. So uh, this seems to be consistent with what we need from the, uh, from the observation. So it looks like these cosmic rays can drive enough turbulence in the upstream to amplify the magnetic field and explain some of the observations that we see from supernova remnants. Okay, so, um, right. So one thing that is, uh, uh, that we studied in detail is to uh, figure out what is the, what determines the number of particles that goes into the tail? So uh, it's roughly around 1%, but uh, why is it 1%? Why is it not 16%? Uh, it's kind of a question that was very, fairly difficult to answer. So we, uh, one of the things we looked at was, um, uh, well, first of all, the shock itself is quite variable. So if you look, this is momentum space of a quasi-parallel shock, and you can see that there are uh, strange uh, uh, overturnings that happen uh, as the shock is propagating. And it turned out that uh, the shock itself is uh, reflecting particles at some times and it's not reflecting particles at other times. So this transmission through the shock is not, uh, not a constant thing in time. Some, some, some particles arrive at a very opportune moment to be reflected and some don't. And um, uh, we now have a, a theory of how this uh, operates. I will not go much into detail on this. There is a paper, but I uh, just want to show you how, the, how we figured this out. So uh, this is a, a, a hybrid simulation of, the, uh, of a shock. So this is momentum space again. What we did, we uh, identified shells of particles. So we said, let's look at a particular piece of the upstream. Let's uh, mark all the particles in there and send them at the shock. 
and then trace their orbits forever in time and see who got into the accelerated tail and who got advected into the downstream. So we kind of did a Rutherford scattering experiment. It, you know, for every shell of particles, we asked, what is the reflected fraction? And uh, what you see is this kind of plot uh, where different shells obviously have different reflective uh, properties. So uh, this shell just went through. Uh, it got reflected. Uh, but most of the particles will, will go into the downstream. So this wasn't a very effective uh, accelerated shell. Now, uh, this effective shell just got launched uh, over here. These are, these are the particles that are coming through. Uh, and uh, it hit the shock at a very opportune time to cause a very big bounce. Uh, so the shock was reforming right at the right moment. So the purple particles will eventually join the uh, diffusive shock acceleration. You can see they do several cycles around the shock, and every cycle they gain energy from this shock drift acceleration. And uh, the lucky ones will eventually end, join the uh, diffusive shock acceleration. They will be able to outrun the shock and escape towards the upstream. And uh, so it turns out that the number of these cycles that particles need to go through uh, to get injected into the accelerated uh, acceleration depends on how inclined the magnetic field is. So the more inclined the magnetic field, the more of these cycles particle need to go through, and every one of these cycles is leaky. So not every particle survives it. So uh, in a sense, the more oblique the shock is, the more of these cycles you need, the few partic fewer particles you will get. That's why the efficiency drops as we go to more and more perpendicular shocks. Uh, okay, so I will stop with this part uh, over here. So um, we can start applying these pictures to uh, understanding supernova remnants. And uh, uh, there is interesting observation in the supernova remnant, for example, 1006 here, that the accelerated efficiency depends on where you are in the shock. So these, this part really accelerates electrons. This one doesn't seem to be accelerating electrons. And uh, the radio, radio measurements seem to suggest that there is a large-scale magnetic field that seems to be oriented this way. And uh, we can calibrate our theories based on this so we can predict which, uh, what inclination of the magnetic field you need to get strong acceleration here and not strong acceleration there. And, uh, Corresponding to it, we can predict how much uh, turbulent magnetic field you will have, so how, 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 how disordered magnetic field you will get. And you can get that from radio polarization measurements of how much disorder you have in the, uh, in the field. So uh, it seems like, indeed, the quasi-parallel shocks are very good at acceleration, as these guys are. Quasi-perpendicular shocks are less so. OK, and uh, of course, uh, so we can map this kind of uh, simplistic plot all we want, but really uh, one should remember that this is really a multidimensional parameter space. So we're only sampling like two-dimensional slice of a n-dimensional parameter space because things may depend on the, say, upstream temperature. They may depend on pre-existing turbulence. They may depend on whether there are inhomogeneities in the flow. So this is a rich problem and, uh, you know, we can continue working on this for a few more years. But uh, it's, um, uh, it's kind of fun, because you can actually try to connect these small things to, to relatively large things. OK, so let me uh, talk about my relativistic magnetospheres, switch gears here a little bit. So um, what motivates this research is pulsars, uh, which are these spinning neutron stars, such as the one in the Crab Nebula. And um, they uh, display amazing uh, uh, phenomenology. So they pulse uh, not only in radio, but also in optical and X-rays and gamma rays. So this is the optical image of the crab at 30 uh, frames per second. Uh, you will see that uh, go on and off. Uh, the idea is that there is uh, some sort of a uh, lighthouse effect on the neutron star. Uh, something is being beamed along presumably a magnetic field that is rotating with a neutron star. And uh, you see these pulses every time uh, the beam is going through a line of sight. This is radio pulses. Each individual pulse is kind of random, but on average, they produce a very stable profile, presumably because of the magnetic field structure. Also, you see them emitting at higher energies. So in gamma rays, particularly recently in the last seven years, 
there has been an abundance of gamma, rays gamma ray pulsars detected with Fermi satellite, and they show interesting morphology of gamma rays, which is very different from radio. So, for example, this is a radio pulse, and this is the gamma ray pulse, actually two pulses per period, and they seem to be offset from the radio. So, they seem to be coming from a different place in the magnetosphere. And uh, they show, uh, so it's a broadband emission. They show emission from radio all the way up to gamma rays. Uh, they also power these nebulae by uh, electromagnetic uh, uh, power that they're producing. So historically, this field has been uh, highly observationally driven. So observers always compete for finding the fastest pulsar, the, the hottest pulsar, the coolest pulsar, the, uh, things like that. And uh, it seems like you're always at an Olympics uh, when you go to a pulsar conference. Uh, on the other hand, the theory was sort of uh, uh, on this side, so we're just kind of trying to tie our shoelaces before we get off to the races. Theoretically, we don't quite understand what's going on. So there's a lot of phenomenology, but we don't quite uh, understand how these things uh, actually work. So despite like 50 years of research, uh, we still have fundamental questions like what is the structure of this magnetosphere? Um, how do pulsars lose energy? Uh, what kind of uh, wind do they produce? How do, where does the energy go? and uh, what's causing the emission, the pulsed emission in the radio, and the gamma rays, and so forth. So the, the zeroth order picture is that uh, there is a dipole stuck to the rotating conductor, and uh, as you rotate this magnetic field, uh, it induces strong uh, electric fields uh, due to the rotation, and uh, these strong electric fields can pull charges from the surface. Uh, so on the surface, you will have strong component of electric field out of, uh, out of the surface. Uh, a particle will be pulled out from the surface. It will curve in the magnetic field. It will radiate curvature radiation, and that curvature photon will pair produce in a very strong 10 to the 12 Gauss magnetic field. And uh, you will start filling the magnetosphere with pairs. And um, <clears throat> these pair discharges will uh, create uh, uh, outflowing plasma. Uh, to zeroth order, there are some field lines which go return back to the star, and some field lines that go out and uh, go out to infinity. Uh, and the difference between them is what's called the light cylinder. So this is a distance where, if you were to rotate with the star, you would have to move, be moving at the speed of light. So this is kind of a near zone versus far zone uh, radiation uh, from a rotating dipole. And uh, <clears throat> The fact that there is a rotating plasma uh, on these magnetic field lines uh, sets the scale for what's known as the minimal charge density in the magnetosphere, also known as goldrake julian charge density. This is, uh, uh, comes from the fact that uh, there is a rotating field, uh, and uh, there is, if there is electric field transfers to the magnetic field to give you this rotation, that electric field will have net divergence, so there must be some charge density uh, in the magnetosphere to provide this corrotating electric field. Um, okay, so the basic physics uh, of the acceleration and, and the whole energy generation boils down to this idea of a Faraday disk. So if you just have a rotating conductor in magnetic field, there will be a potential difference between the center of the disk and the edge of the disk. And if you don't believe it, you can do this experiment in your basement. So uh, this is a, a magnet, this is a battery, uh, and uh, this circuit connects the edge of the battery to the center of the battery, uh, or edge of the magnet to the center of the magnet. So there is a current flowing through the magnetic field, and that makes this thing rotate, right? So a pulsar is kind of this thing in reverse. So a pulsar is spinning magnet, spinning magnet, and it has a potential difference between the edge and the center. And then if you can manage to connect the circuit, which is what pulsar wind does, if you manage to connect the circuit and drive a current, you will draw power from this rotating object. So you can, you can slow it down. And that's exactly what's happening. So you have a 10 to the 12 gauss battery, so, sorry, a magnetic ma magnet, 10 to the 16 volt battery, and a pulsar wind as a circuit. So, uh, as I mentioned, this, this cartoon that comes from Goldrick and Julian in 1969 says that there is this co-rotating magnetosphere, there are open field lines separated by the light cylinder, and uh, 
as these field lines are rotating, there will be electric field so that E cross B gives you the rotational velocity. Uh, you can see that this electric field has net, uh, net divergence, so there is a charge density here. Uh, if that charge is flowing out at the speed of light, there is a current. Uh, that current will provide a toroidal magnetic field. And uh, now you have toroidal magnetic field, poloidal electric field, E cross B equals pointing flux. So there is a radial pointing flux that this thing is radiating. So this spinning conductor in the presence of plasma will produce a radial, radial pointing flux, which is the spin down. And so that's, it's losing energy to the outside world. Okay. Uh, and that's where what mostly pulsars do. Now the question is, how do they get to this state? So you need, you need the plasma in the magnetosphere. And how it got there turns out to be non-trivial. And for that, we actually need simulation. So there are kind of two directions you can go. One is to say that there is uh, uh, no dense plasma in the magnetosphere. Another is to say that there is plasma there from the very beginning. Uh, and uh, so this direction, where you say that there was plasma from the very beginning, leads you to say that the whole magnetosphere is just magnetohydrodynamics, or what's called force-free. Uh, this regime, uh, you actually try to create particles, extract them from the surface, and see how pair production works. And this can lead to what's called charge-separated uh, magnetospheres. And um, reality is probably somewhere in between. So you have both regions of charge separation and regions which are close to MHD. Um, so, right. So, uh, let me just show you how these solutions uh, look like. So, we talked about force free uh, electromagnetism uh, in uh, Lewis's talks. Uh, but basically, the idea is that you have, um, you say that there is plasma everywhere, uh, it's just shorting out all of the accelerating electric fields. What's providing the plasma, you don't specify, you just assume it is there from the very beginning. Uh, and uh, the Maxwell's equations with a constraint that the electromagnetic forces are very strong and stronger than the inertia, uh, so that there is net force is equal to zero at every point on the field line, give you this constraint on the current uh, as a function of electric and magnetic field. And this is called a force-free system of equations. You can throw it on the computer, just Maxwell's equations with a prescription for the current, and you can evolve it in time. And uh, this is what it looks like. So you start with a dipole, you spin it. The color here is the out-of-plane magnetic field. So you develop a wound-up magnetic field in one direction, wound up in the other way on the bottom, because these, are, these field lines are returning, uh, and these are outgoing. And um, uh, you form this closed zone and, and open zone, and it settles to an equilibrium. So the, the current structure uh, is that there is an outflowing current on these field lines, and there is a return current uh, splitting at the Y point and coming down uh, to the star. And uh, you can solve this even in three dimensions. Uh, so this is the force-free simulation in 3D, and you can see how the field lines look. Uh, there's a closed zone, open zone, and uh, uh, you could have a three-dimensional uh, rotator. The uh, solution so already with this uh, field geometry, you can do a lot of things. You can try to uh, beam radiation along different field lines. If you do that, uh, one hint emerges is that uh, this current sheet uh, that forms around the, white, uh, the, the light cylinder and beyond, this equatorial current sheet, which seems to be inclined in this case, uh, is uh, a region where light should be originated to, for the gamma rays. So, to, to explain the double peak gamma rays, you want the pulse to come from right here and then from right here, and they will be offset from the radio which comes from there. So the radio and the gamma rays can be offset this way if the gamma rays are coming from the current sheet. And so this gives you a hint that there is something interesting going on in this current sheet, and uh, you could eventually model this. So um, these uh, abundant plasma models which assume a plasma everywhere, they allow us to do interesting things. They allow us to compute some spin down, how it depends on the inclination angle and so forth, but they don't have any physics of acceleration and no, no explicit physics of radiation. So uh, we're not completely sure that these solutions actually work. And in fact, when we tried to do this with just particle and cell straightforwardly, we, we encountered a, a strange solution. So uh, if you just allow particles to leave the surface, uh, and uh, let's say you don't have any pair production, 
then uh, what you get are these strange solutions. So electrons here are shown in white and red as the ions are positrons, which are extracted from the star. As the star is rotating, there are electric fields that pull the charges off the surface. And you form, form these strange uh, electrospheres. These are kind of electrostatically trapped charges hanging around the star. There's almost no wind uh, being produced. Uh, and uh, even if you incline this thing, it still is not producing a nice outflow. So uh, there is some sort of electrostatic trap that does not allow these particles to uh, produce a nice wind. Uh, so when we started playing with PIC uh, with this problem, we decided, well, let's see if we can check this solution against uh, uh, our force-free simulation. So in the force-free simulations, we assumed that everything was filled with plasma. And indeed, if we dump a lot of plasma onto the PIC simulation, it does produce something that looks like a force-free. So it produces these closed field lines, open field lines, and uh, there is an outflow. And uh, the spin down is very similar. The current does what you expect. Uh, this is an outflowing current. This is a returning current. And um, uh, we also see acceleration of particles in the sheet. So the, these, in the sheet, you have these alternating magnetic fields, which cause reconnection, and that accelerates particles. So this shows the region where most of the accelerated particles live which then seems to be in the current sheet, which is good. So if the, if the magnetosphere can be filled with plasma, then this is consistent with what we want to get from the, uh, to, to see gamma rays. Now, um, but let's see if we can actually fill the magnetosphere with plasma. So here, uh, so Alex Chen, who is in this audience, uh, has uh, tried the simulation with pair production. Uh, so you not only just pull out charges from the surface, but you also allow for pair production. And uh, this shows the, uh, his plot for the uh, density of uh, positive particles and density of negative particles. And uh, what you see is that there is abundance of negative particles here and no positive particles. That means that even though you were pulling uh, charges from the surface and you allowed for pair production, you don't get a lot of pairs in the polar zone. So only the kind of a charge-separated solution is flowing out here. And uh, in the current sheet, you do have both signs. And so if you have pair production in the current sheet, then uh, this solution seems to produce a wind. It's a little bit weird because uh, this, uh, this is not going to be a nice pair plasma in here. So what's going to make radio emission? We're not clear. But nevertheless, this was a solution. We got very similar result with our code. So this is a uh, electron density and positron density. You can see that there is abundance of electrons, not much in terms of positrons. So there is not much pair production going on. And uh, we tried inclining this thing and looking in 3D, uh, and it's still pretty much the same. So there is not much active pair production going on. So what, what's happening? Uh, it turned out that um, just uh, by the uh, kind of unlucky coincidence, maybe, is that um, the, uh, what's going on is that the, these polar caps are being constrained to provide a certain amount of current uh, that the global magnetosphere tells it to provide. So the, the current is set by the twist of the overall large-scale magnetosphere. Uh, and the twist is set by the physics of the light cylinder. And, uh, that tells you how much current needs to be produced. And then the local electrostatics tries to pull out the right sign of charge from the surface. And then uh, if there is possibility of acceleration, pairs will be produced and they will try to uh, create this current uh, while main maintaining rotation of the whole plasma. So it turns out that um, there's a critical uh, parameter, the current density uh, that flows along these field lines divided by the uh, characteristic uh, charge density in the magnetosphere, which is called the goldrick julian charge density times the speed of light. And uh, if this parameter is smaller than one, so the current is sub goldrick julian then you can provide all the current you need by just non-relativistic advection of charge. Uh, if this current is larger than the goldrick julian current, then you cannot move the particles fast enough to provide the current, so there must be some acceleration and discharge to produce more current that you can pull out with just net one charge, uh, one sign of charge. So uh, it turns out that when you look at the global solution, the, this uh, current is just smaller than the uh, goldrick julian current, so you don't get a lot of pair production, or it seems like you don't. And uh, 
this uh, was really puzzling because we certainly do see pulsars uh, in the radio. They, they seem to be happily producing plasma, so something is going horribly wrong. And uh, uh, so Sasha Filippo, uh, who is a graduate student here, uh, realized that um, what we're missing is uh, something that we thought was completely irrelevant, which is general relativity. So uh, what general relativity does here is a, a very simple effect. What it does is it uh, drags space-time around. So there is this lens-tearing uh, 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 drag of the space. And um, what that does is it changes effective angular velocity of space-time. So uh, when you're sitting close to a neutron star, your effective angular frequency is different fr than what you would have inferred from infinity. So uh, what that does is it changes your local uh, space charge that you need for rotation of the, uh, of the field. So the local uh, charge density drops, uh, while the current that, requ that is required is still maintained uh, from the twist at the light cylinder, which is far enough in the flat space. So the current and the local goldilocks Julian density now are not controlled by the same thing. And uh, there, uh, you can have a situation for reasonable compactnesses of neutron stars that the current over goldilocks Julian charge density becomes uh, larger than one. And then you start getting uh, pair production and cascades. So uh, he had to do, to do this, he modified his PIC code uh, by adding all of these uh, GR terms. So this is a gravitoelectric term, I suppose, which depends on the lens tearing frequency here. And this is the lapse function. So we added these terms to the Maxwell's equations and uh, evolved particles in this uh, uh, curved spacetime. And this is what it looks like. So this is electron density, this is positron density. So initially you, you have only pair production on very small uh, part of the uh, of the uh, open zone, but eventually you do. So you, you do produce a lot of pairs here. So you, this pair production region expands. Uh, it doesn't cover all of the field lines, but you do get dense plasma at least on some polar field lines. And uh, this persists in uh, three dimensions. So if you go to uh, 3D, uh, this is the plot in the uh, plane of uh, rotation and, and uh, magnetic field. And uh, you see here electron density and positron density, which means that there's pair production going on. Uh, this is the case in flat space. You don't have a lot of pairs here. So this is positrons, this is electrons. Okay, so uh, GR seems to really save the day and uh, it seems to be important, although we really didn't, didn't expect that to, to be important. And uh, now with these global models, you can actually try to produce light curves so we, you can you actually have reconnection happening in these current sheets and we can actually model this reconnection. We can look at the particle spectra and also we can beam radiation as it, as it flies out. And uh, this is the kind of light curves that you produce. So you can get these double peaked uh, light curves uh, per period. So it looks like um, the, uh, these kinetic models are allowing us to not only model the global structure of the solution, but also to understand the mission by looking deeply in what's happening in the current sheets. Uh, so finally, in the last minute, I want to show you uh, some results from reconnection. So uh, physics of reconnection was important for this pulsar stuff, but really you can study it in isolation, and this has been done for uh, many years in many contexts. So the one I'm, I'm more interested in is relativistic reconnection, which means that uh, the electric, uh, sorry, the, the magnetic energy is comparable or larger than the rest mass. So this parameter magnetic energy divided by the rest mass uh, is uh, larger than one, which leads to a relativistic uh, situation. And uh, these simulations were done by uh, Lorenzo Cironi. So what you have here is a magnetic field that's alternating initially, and you have a current sheet over here. And uh, as you let it go, it starts reconnecting. You see a lot of islands here, and these islands start to merge. And uh, there are X points that are created. So we'll zoom in on one of these regions in the next slide. Uh, <clears throat> this shows the magnetic energy. Uh, so there are regions where magnetic field is enhanced and regions where the magnetic field is being depleted. So let's zoom in on this region more. So this shows the density 
uh, you see this formation of plasmoids outflowing from the X points, and uh, they reach larger and larger blobs and eventually merge. So uh, these kind of simulations are uh, a little bit tricky because you have to worry about boundary conditions. So uh, we actually have simulations which allow uh, for very nice outflowing boundary conditions on this side, so we don't have to worry about the periodicity in that direction, which seems to plague a lot of uh, simulations in this, uh, in this field. Uh, and uh, so we have, uh, this shows the inflow velocity and outflow velocity in the, in the reconnection region. And uh, what we find is that reconnection is indeed fast. It goes at about uh, half, uh, 0.1 alpha in velocity. But what's more interesting is that it uh, um, produces non-thermal power loss. So if we look at the total spectrum, uh, what we find is that there is a nice power law that's being produced, and uh, the power law index is somewhere between two and one, depending on how strong the magnetization is. And um, so if you were to just naively convert all of the magnetic energy into Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, you would get something like this, which is definitely not a good fit. And uh, uh, the physics of this acceleration is still a bit uh, subject of theological debates between different groups. Uh, but what's clear is that, so here's a particle, it went through the X point, uh, then it ended up in a big island, and uh, here it gained more energy as the two islands merged, and it experienced what's called anti-reconnection. So you can see this is its energy, right? So uh, it's clear that most of the energy is being gained in the islands when the, and when the islands contract and merge. Uh, however, what we find is that uh, this is not the reason why you get a power law. So convergence in the islands is something that can boost your energy, but uh, it's not what determines the power law. It seems like that the fact that there, are, there is a power law is determined by this moment. So only the particles that cross, uh, cross close to the X points, when they cr close, uh, cross close to the X points, that's what sets the initial uh, power law, which then gets amplified when uh, when these uh, islands start to merge uh, and, uh, and produce more reconnection. So this is shown here. So the highest energy particles, this shows energy versus uh, location where particles cross the current sheet. And uh, the ones that cross close to the X point, which is this region, uh, they gain most of the, uh, they, they become highest energy particles. Uh, the ones that cross outside this region get less energy. But the power law is already set uh, right there. Okay, so um, we find that reconnection uh, is efficient. Uh, it proceeds at fast velocities, but by 0.1c uh, for relativistic case, uh, it uh, generates interesting non thermal spectra uh, and uh, they can get flatter with higher magnetization. So here it's, here's a plot with different magnetization. You can get all the way uh, up to uh, energy to the almost minus one which is very unusual for shocks. So this could be a nice way to discriminate between uh, uh, shock acceleration and, and reconnection. So I think I'm out of time. And um, just one last thing. Uh, so we actually try to test some of these things that our codes produce uh, in the laboratory. So uh, we... Uh, one of the predictions of the shock simulation is that there is this, there are these instabilities that mediate uh, shock physics, and um, uh, one of them is the Weibel instability. So we actually tried to create uh, collisionless shocks in the laboratory using intense lasers, and uh, the reason you need intense lasers is you want plasmas to have low collisionality, which forces you to have high speeds, uh, and uh, your volume is limited, so you need large uh, energy densities. So uh, the way to do that is with laser plasma interaction. So what we usually do is we ablate plastics uh, with strong lasers, and that creates flows of around 1,000 kilometers per second. And uh, those flows are effectively collision-less, and then they can interact and produce interesting uh, shock formation. So here, this is a typical experiment. We have two pieces of plastic separated by 5 millimeters or 8 millimeters, and uh, you have 4 kilojoule lasers ablating this plastic and that sends 1,000 kilometer per second flows at each other. And uh, as they interact, we send diagnostic protons 
uh, MEV protons crossing, and then they collect, get collected on the film, and we can see what electromagnetic structures they probed. And uh, this is what we see. So this is data as a function of time. We see these kind of filamentary structures develop. So, uh, and this is simulation with uh, our PIC codes. We see very similar uh, filament filamentary structures uh, develop from Weibull instability. So we have evidence now that uh, Weibull instability actually does happen, uh, and, and it's probably the mechanism that eventually leads to shock formation. Uh, so current experiments are pushing this forward to actually try this for magnetized shock. So we're adding external magnetic fields, and we're trying to see if we can get magnetized shock, and if, if we can study these transitions uh, and physics that we, we see with our PIC simulations in the laboratory. Okay, so um, this is it. Uh, I'm, uh, I discussed these different um, uh, applications. I think the open question in this field is still how to connect, uh, uh, so, so I mean, how the microphysics actually works, but then the bigger question is how to connect the microphysics to the larger scale. And so we've tried it in some cases. I don't think there is a good recipe to do this for all cases, but one can try. I think this is, uh, very profitable thing to, to continue doing. Thank you. Sorry I'm out of time. <laughs>